I know what you're thinking, something's different. That's right, I've decided to go for a goatee for a few weeks. Oh, and also, Battery Man has a microphone now. Yes, I plan on getting out and about and visiting places and people. Not just sticking in a studio and talking about what I'm learning with the electrical stuff. There might be one or two interviews coming in the next few weeks. I'm not sure if you realize that electricians have their own secret language. C1, C2, equipotential bonding, arms reach, OCPD, what do they mean? Yes, that's right, arms reach is defined in the regulations. Come and join me on this week's journey in becoming an electrician. I started off this week by looking at the building regulations and seeing how they affect the install of electrical work. Interestingly, if you were to do some electrical work on an existing install, you don't have to rip out the old install if it doesn't meet the current regulations. But it's important that the old install is up to basic requirements. An example of this would be the old colors of cabling with the red and black that was phased out in 2004 but these cables, they're still in many homes, including my own. So they don't require ripping out to work on or to add a circuit if they're in good condition and have the correct insulation resistance. It's important for any electrician to please building regs and more specifically to comply with part P of the building regs and ideally to be part of a part P competent person scheme. This means that the electrician doesn't have to contact building regs before they carry out work or to have another fully qualified third party certified to inspect their work but instead they hand over money to an organisation instead who will do it for them. Because they're trained and qualified meeting the competent person scheme standard the relevant notifications to building control can be done afterward through the competent person scheme. One operator for example is NICEIC. You may have spotted them on electrical vans. I'm not sure how much it would cost, but it would certainly need to be factored in if going self-employed. I've got to talk about arms reach. The wiring regulations for electrical work quite literally defines an arms reach as 1.25 meters and two and a half meters from the ground. Now you know, this is definitely for safety. Sometimes you want people to be able to reach things and sometimes you don't want people to be able to reach things. So that comes in important. Equipotential bonding is one of the terms in the glossary I studied about this week. This is basically linking any metal parts such as exposed metal structures or water pipes back to the main earthing block. This is so that there can't be any rogue voltages that could cause you any harm. And because I know you're dying to know, an OCPD is an overcurrent protection device and not a personality disorder. Yeah, that's OCD. Yes, what we're really talking about is fuses and circuit breakers. This glossary is quite literally pages long. The names or words that interested me most related to EV charging where it described the different modes for charging, starting with the standard granny charger mode 1 charging, which doesn't exceed 16 amps, through to mode 4 charging. I believe mode 4 are the beefy DC chargers on the road networks. I was also interested in the descriptions for the different parts of solar, or PV photovoltaic, from the array to the module and so on. I then looked this week at the process for testing and commissioning, breaking down each of the steps. So to explain, we're going to presume that you've designed and installed whatever circuit you intended to install. With the system dead, regulations require that the system is inspected and tested to ensure that it follows the wiring codes. The tests that would be carried out are the ones that we discussed in week two and week eight. Once we're happy with the test meeting the standards, the system is then made live and you can check the correct operation of the equipment connected 
and the earthing tests. A certificate would then be produced depending on the type of install. The test results are then recorded on the certificate and it would be signed by the person that carried out the tests. On large setups, say for example the rewiring of a supermarket, it could be a different person that designs, a different person that installs, and a different person that tests. So they would all need to sign the relevant certificates. In domestic settings, it's generally one person that does all these things. This installation certificate would contain information that's relevant to the incoming supply, the earthing arrangements for the relevant circuits, and display the test results also. This certificate would then be given to the person that ordered the work. Believe it or not, this handing over of this document is part of the regulations, which I guess makes sense. This signifies handover to the client, and once you're paid, you're out of there. Well, I'm gonna leave it there for this week. Next week, we'll look at some of the unsafe electrical practices that I'm sure most electricians have come across at some point, usually in older properties. Over the years, the electrical industry looks like it has changed quite a lot. Join me next week as we look at some unsafe practices. I don't know about you, but I can't wait till next time. If you've made it this far, thank you. It takes a fair amount of time and effort to get these videos out, and this channel is new and quite small. So if you found this video or any of the others interesting, then please like and subscribe. Hopefully, more people can benefit from what we discuss by finding this channel. Battery Man out.